the speech by the best man. <laughs> Generally considered the highlight of the wedding speech lineup. No pressure, Johnny. But, but I think it's fair to say. <laughs> Just pass that down. <laughs> but I think it's fairly obvious that. <laughs> That when the best man stands up, it's the groom who's going to be the most nervous. He's going to worry that the best man will entertain the guests with hilarious stories of that alcohol-fueled evening involving the donkey, the Latvian lady of easy virtue, <laughs> and the wet celery. <laughs> but you know, and some of you already know this, but I don't think we need worry, because although Johnny has done an excellent job so far of being Andy's best man, next year, in April, Andy is going to do an equally good job of being Johnny's best man. <laughs> and the key word here is equally. Because what we have is a Mexican standoff. Because if Johnny tells us all about the evening and the alcohol and the, and the donkey and the lady and the celery, then next year at Johnny and Joe's wedding, Andy will regale all their guests with the details of who it was who stole the donkey. <laughs> exactly who did exactly what with the Latvian lady of easy virtue and precisely where she stuck the celery. <laughs> no, I don't think we have any trouble there either. Which brings us to the speech by the father of the bride. Me. Thank you. One fan. And I think it's fairly obvious that the, the single person who's going to be the most nervous and the most worried is the bride herself. Good. That's how it should be. Now, the serial wedding attenders among you are beginning to wonder already how long is this speech going to go on? Well, let me just remind you of one thing. I'm paying. <laughs> so frankly, nothing is going to stop me saying whatever I want to until I think I've had enough, apart from perhaps a severe blow to the back of the head from my dear lady wife. <laughs> or it was indeed going to be a fork in the thigh, but they cleared those away, to be fair. Or possibly bribes in the form of offers of free drinks from the bar. Mine's a malt whiskey on ice. Thank you. No? OK, well, I hope you're all sitting very, very comfortably, because we begin. Many, 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 many years ago, when Rosemary was expecting our first child, the thorny subject of names came up. Then, as now, it wasn't uncommon for celebrities to choose their names based on the occasion or location where they had... Um, cuddled. <laughs> well, we did consider this, but we decided that the name knackered and tired after a long drive from France wasn't really appropriate. <laughs> just wasn't appropriate for a small child. So we went down the more traditional route of choosing names in the event that it was a girl or a boy. If it was a boy, in a bizarre homage to the Indiana in Indiana Jones, Rosemary decided that, her, that his name would be Timothy David. Timothy after her dog. <laughs> it's absolutely true. Fortunately, it was a girl. Well, certainly fortunate for Andy. Otherwise, <laughs> this would be a very different affair with a lot more scatter cushions and <laughs> possibly a Hawaiian luau theme. <laughs> Can I just say, if you keep laughing, it's your own time you're wasting. <laughs> um, and she was born on November the 11th, Armistice Day. And it suddenly dawned on me, noting the date, why don't we call her Poppy after the day? Well, in the first of what was to be a long line of very similar events where the children were concerned, my idea was vetoed. <laughs> and Emily Kate it was. Now, when Emily was born, she was a big baby. Well, she was huge. Ba well, she was, it, she was actually eye-wateringly enormous. And I spent most of my time up at the head end, something I recommend to at least two gentlemen in this room. Um, you know who you are. <laughs> but even my eyes watered. And looking at her diminutive figure now, it does make you wonder whether they didn't swap her in the delivery room. And that, and that somewhere else in the UK there's another wedding taking place, perhaps with very small parents, but a really big bride. <laughs> uh, but we took her home and we loved her. And when she was five, I got invited to go and work in America. So the whole family, now including David, or Fido, as Rosemary wants to call it. <laughs> <laughs> I said you get a mention. We upsticked and off we went to Connecticut, USA, for six years. And it's difficult to choose a story from that period, because if we could do it, we did do it. So whether it was riding across a desert, or whether it was white Christmases at home, or hotels in California, or meeting Japanese Minnie in Florida, we did it. 
But for Emily, the six years were spent full-time in the US education system. And that, coupled with the fact that this is, after all, a wedding, makes it appropriately inappropriate for me to say a few words about sex education, American style. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh. <laughs> now, Connecticut, where we lived, is very prudish, and they wouldn't teach this subject in school time. So the deal was that they had the courses in the evening, and a parent had to go with each child. And I well remember sitting in Emily's classroom with my bum shoved into a chair four sizes too small for it, watching Emily colouring in a picture. <laughs> and she was doing a great job, staying inside all the lines, using all the felt tip pens on the table, the reds, the greens, the blues, the oranges, the purples, as she carefully and assiduously coloured in a highly detailed anatomical cross-section of a gentleman's wedding tackle. <laughs> Now, this proved to be the only picture she did at school that we never actually took home and put on the fridge. <laughs> Frighten the natives. But because it never went on the fridge, it never got ripped, Emily, or torn, or used as a shopping list. And when I went up to the shed... <laughs> a little extra wedding present for you. Anyway, in 1995, we came back to the UK. We moved into the house up by the church, where we all were earlier today. Emily went to school in Ashbourne at Queggs. Go, Queggs! Thank you. <laughs> was that the idea of a cheer? I was pathetic. And it was here that Emily made her life choice of her career. But being Emily, not after hour, well, days and days of research into the subject of medicine, which seemed to consist mainly of watching every episode of ER. <laughs> but unfortunately, the BMA wouldn't accept that as evidence of actual qualifications of being a doctor, so they demanded five years of book learning, so Sheffield Uni it was. <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> so, so off she went, she met a lot of interesting people. <laughs> she learned a lot of interesting things, of which I hope she doesn't tell us. And she got some very interesting bruises. You see, the deal was, occasionally, Rosemary and I would drive up to Sheffield with the intention of taking Emily out for a high-protein, low-pot noodle-based meal. <laughs> and on this occasion, it was a warm day, and Emily took her top off, and she was covered in bruises all down this side. Really big, livid bruises. No idea how she'd got them. Later in the afternoon, friends were texting her, how are you? Are you okay? Did you get home? Still not a clue. After a while, she pieces it together that the night before, she'd been out to Pop-Tarts. <laughs> ah, for the elderly, Pop-Tarts, it's like a tea dance, but with alcohol, and with the volume knob on the phonograph turned up to 11. Um, anyway, she'd been there, and indeed, Emily had consumed alcohol. In fact, she consumed copious amounts. In fact, she'd consumed sufficient alcohol to ultimately guarantee that she would fall over, hence the bruises. But in between consuming enough alcohol to ensure she fell over and actually falling over, she continued consumption, <laughs> thus guaranteeing the next morning she had a significant and lasting case of amnesia. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you this because I'm proud of my daughter's behaviour. I'm still not. <laughs> I'm telling this for Andy's benefit. Because, Andy, at some point in your married life, you are going to do something that you want her to forget. It's inevitable. You're a bloke. <laughs> now, for the rest of the married men in this room, we have to rely upon the dimming of our wives' memory simply through the passage of time until the infraction, whatever it may have been, is only remembered in the rare event that we're in danger of winning an argument. <laughs> but for you, Andy, you have a shortcut to amnesia. You are truly blessed. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, keep that going. So, bruises at university, a bad thing. But to be fair, she met Andy, which was a good thing. But then Andy had to leave university, which was a bad thing. But he only left because he graduated, which was a good thing. But then he had to get a job, which is a bad thing. But then he got a job, which is a good thing, but the job was on the west coast of Lancashire, which is a bad thing. But then Emily graduated, which was a good thing. But then Emily needed a job, and jobs in Sheffield were a long way from Lancashire, which was a bad thing. <laughs> So she got a job in Preston, which was a good thing. So they moved in together, which was a thing. Now, <laughs> they moved into Andy's small rented house with its one bed. Now, as my financially conscious daughter pointed out to me, beds are very expensive. <laughs> and anyway, it didn't matter because she got a bolster that she could put down the middle to prevent any incursions into the neutral zone. <laughs> In the fullness of time, they bought a house together, a very nice house with a surfeit of bedrooms and ultimately a surfeit of beds. But as my environmentally conscious daughter pointed out to me, it would be wasteful of heat to heat more rooms than were absolutely <laughs> necessary.